Hello everyone and welcome to lecture three of reinforcement learning. My name is Adam Leach, I'm one of Chris's PhD students and I'll be giving today's lecture. Uh, we're going to be focusing more on the practical side of reinforcement learning um, and we're going to look at OpenAI Gym, which is a library of environments for agents to act in or on uh, and how that can be used to implement reinforcement learning algorithms and you know, train, train stuff basically. Uh, so open AI. So a quick overview of the lecture first. I'm going to be, I'm going to talk about a brief, um, briefly about the motivation behind it, as well as going into um, what environments are like available in open AI gym, um, uh, as well as how that maps onto the RLW concepts, uh, like the environments and space classes which are in uh, open AI gym, which are the two heavily used parts of it, um, and then I'll move on to a couple of talk about a couple of caveats with training uh, reinforcement learning algorithms uh, followed by a well, quite long collab demo where we'll um, basically train, a, well, train some stuff in OpenAI. Uh, after that I'm also going to talk about NCC which is the departmental co compute cluster um, which has a load of GPUs for usage uh, in training projects. Um, the main advantage is you can run stuff for longer than you can on Google Colab. Um, both deep learning and reinforcement learning uh, problems, which means that you can, well, you can trace it for longer, get better results, and just not have to deal with all the limitations that Colab has. So OpenAI Gym, at its most basic level, was created to answer the question of how do we compare different reinforcement learning algorithms? Um, in general, it's really difficult to replicate results if you're working on different implementations of the same environment. Um, that's down to lots of problems with um, randomness and how important it is during sampling uh, environments, but we won't get into that. Uh, so the whole point is that you can th these environments all have the same common standardized API. You know, they all have the same methods and they, they, they describe themselves in an easy way, which makes it quite quite easy to write um, generalized code that works across different environments. Um, for example, one of the environments you can have is just an Atari 2600 and there's about 50 different games you can play on it and what makes it really good is that you have the same observation and you have the same action space so you can literally just change the name of the environment, change the type of environment and exactly the same code. And this allows you to compare how the same algorithm runs in different games and see which games are easier or which games are harder um, because of the implicit nature of the environment and not something because of you know how big is the action space how many different things can i do well they're both the same in this it's just the environment itself is more complicated or it's more difficult to explore because you need to do lots of like chosen actions like chosen like um motivated actions to get anywhere and that's what you end up with in this graph I have on the right hand side is that games like pinball when you know you just flip paddle whenever the uh, ball comes near the uh, well, near the, well you flip the paddle when the ball comes near it that, that's not hard to beat um, but longer games like uh, Pac-Man where you have to have a considerable um, uh, long series of motivated actions to score well um, a lot of reinforcement algorithms don't do well on this, so you can probably see that uh, Pac-Man, Mrs. Pac-Man is down the bottom here, whereas Pinball is at the top here, and that shows you what mean. So there are many different environments available in OpenAI. Um, you have full 2D and 3D physics simulations. Um, there are things like class control, which are problems from you know physics and basic dynamics. Um, there's also simple text ones, which are meant to just be easy to learn to test your, if your RL algorithm is doing anything really stupid on or not. Uh, and it's also very easy to extend as well. You can write your own environments very quickly. You only have to implement about um, three or four methods and fill in a couple of attributes, and you can just run RL algorithms on these things as well. So it's uh, yeah, it's really good. It's really nice to use. Um, so if you've seen any of the basics of our RL concepts, um, you might be aware of the uh, actor environment model. Like you have an actor which 
gives an action to the environment, like it takes an action to the environment, and the environment responds with a uh, observation. It also, and the actor acts upon that observation, chooses an action based on that observation that goes round and round and round and round the loop. Uh, and that's basically what I've shown on the right here. It's this this set of like actor environment loop, but as explicit Python code. Um, you create an environment. Uh, this one's cart pole. Uh, you will see it later in the demo. Um, we create an actor. We reset the environment to get the basic state, like the starting position of the cart and the pole on it. And then we just loop through uh, actions based upon what the actor sees. And we feed those into the environment and we pull out the observation from that. We also pull out a reward signal um, as well as a boolean that says oh, is it done or not and some info metadata but the core the core loop of this if you were evaluating an actor and just seeing how it moves and just letting it move through space without training it at all is just the action and observation pair they just go back and forth back and forth back and forth so the gym dot environment uh, class um, instances of it uh, have a set of different methods and core two, you want to care about a reset and step. These are the two I was talking about in the previous slide I used, which are, well, you know, you get your initial observation and then you just take steps in your, through your environment. Uh, the reason you want to use reset rather than just creating a new environment every time is that sometimes if your init function does something heavy, like, I don't know, if it's connecting to an external process which boots up an entire game and it needs to load in all the textures, your re which takes quite a bit of time your reset might just be oh you know put everything back to the starting position um which means it's running loads and loads of loops and training loads and loads of different runs is a lot faster uh the step step is well you know it takes a step like in a shooting thing it might be like okay what are you doing this frame oh, i'm going to be forward if you're in a game of pong it's like oh this step I'm going to move up or this step I'm going to move down. Um, and those are your actions that you feed into it. Uh, so from out of that, you get a tuple, which is observation, reward, done and info. Uh, I think you've got observation. You obviously should know that. Reward just tells you how how much like how much goodness you get from your current signal. Like we've um, you've seen in the previous lectures what the reward is, so we've got over it. So an environment also, also the important thing is that environment can end. Environments have a finite finish point most of the time. Um, in fact, certain forms of training you need it to finish in order to know how good the entire thing was. Uh, so um, yeah, that's just what they've done. Really, does it, it just says back to the um, actor? Yeah, you, you, you're done here. That's it. Um, and then you can finish the run, reset it, and start again. And then there's the info dict, which is just a dict of metadata. Um, as an example, the Atari games, the info dictionary tells you how many lives you have left. But that's something that you don't show to the actor. It shouldn't, you shouldn't know about that. Um, yeah, there's a few additional methods, um, which are quite, some of them are very useful. Some of them it's like, oh, OK. So the seed method. Uh, is very useful. If you have a environment uh, which has any degree of randomness, it's very important that you can set the seed of that randomness. And the reason that's important is that a lot of these up reinforcement learning algorithms are incredibly sensitive to to the initial few stages of training because they they try and exploit any rewards they find. So, if you have a situation where you're first few samples don't really correspond well to the general distribution of you know the state action reward pairs you think you should get then you end up with the reinforcement learning algorithms learning very getting very strange ideas early on about how how the uh, environment acts and because it's trying to exploit those strange ideas it ends up performing badly and it won't figure out how to perform well so by having a fixed seed, um, what happens is you're tweaking things and trying different runs. Um, 
you can see how it performs on basically the same data. Um, if if you if you don't have a fixed seed and you basically run the same algorithm twice, um, identical identical parameters, identical high parameters, you'll just see it go get completely different results. Like it'll take twice as long before it realizes, oh, this is the right thing to do. Two, three, four times as long. So having a fixed seed means you can compare different approaches in a way that's much that's taking a degree of uncertainty out of it like without a fixed seed you don't know if it's because the, the method's crap or if it's because the um or if it's because the well the algorithm or because of just like poor sampling uh the render method is also quite useful um all these things with like your your what your actor sees and the actions it spits out um well i mean they're just a load of floats or there are loads of integers like they're, they're quite difficult to actually understand uh the render method is entirely for you as a person to view what the environment looks like that's that's all that's all it's there for so when you are training something unless you want to look at it and physically inspect yourself what's going on you don't you, you don't use the render method that's the only time it ever comes in handy and it is very handy because it is generally a good idea to see what your algorithm's doing and you know what choices it's making but um it's very dependent as well um it's the, very dependent on how your environment is constructed so in the Atari case, uh, environment.render will pop open a window of like, hey, what what does the screen of this Atari game look like right now? Or it can render to an RGB array. Um, or in other things like uh, the toy text example environments, it just pops up a little printout of like the text in, that it's looking at. Um, but in, in the cart poll example, and this is where a big contrast is, in cart poll, um, the observation that the uh, actor sees is just a list of velocities and positions whereas the render gives you a full like 2d little little square little window popping up that says that shows you where the cart is and where the um pole on top of it is um so yeah that's 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 why render is so important that you can see you can physically see and understand just intuitively what is going on rather than having to understand the array of floats um closed method yeah it performs cleanup yeah as it says there performs cleanup actions and stops the environment um what that means is like i mean in most cases for a lot of the ba a lot of the included gym environments it doesn't really do anything it just says oh okay well shut it down normally um in other examples like when i was talking about the reset example you might be communicating to a different process that's running a full game the closed method would send a termination signal to that process it would basically say okay yeah you need to like shut down the game and close everything and you know terminate uh so it's um yeah so for most of the training you'll be doing you, that's not really necessary um particular note is if you use the with syntax the way you would if you were opening a file um, environment.close gets called automatically at the end of the indented part so it's quite useful for that yeah just but if you yeah if you've got something that's a bit complicated and talks to an external environment or process you know maybe you know, heaven forbid you're talking to a stock trading robot or algorithm or heaven or you're talking to a third-party game treat it as if the environment's like a file object and open it using the width syntax and it'll automatically perform the cleanup and close now there's a few other attributes that go along with a uh, environment um a, a gym object uh once it's instanced will have a action space and observation space attribute um these are very useful as they can be used to they can be um, in, interrogated to find out what shape the data you feed into as an action is and what shape the response you get back from an environment is um i'll talk a bit more about what those spaces actually are on the next slide but uh, there's also a few other attributes that aren't quite as important um so each gym object has to implement something called 
implement something called a reward range. Um, most, and this just says, hey, like, what's the maximum reward I can get in a time step? What's the minimum reward I can get in a time step? Um, by default, it's minus infinity to plus infinity, but um, there are some algorithms out there like RMAX, which need to know what the maximum reward is at each step um, in order to optimize properly. Um, no one really uses RMAX though, so it, it's kind of like not really necessary, but there's no real situations where you don't really know what your reward, maximum reward is going to be. So it's kind of all right. Um, there's also metadata in spec. Um, they're just, they're just, you know, they're just uh, dictionaries and metadata, and also the spec and attribute can be used by um, like wrappers around environment classes that put in like automatic monitoring or, you know, rendering a video of a run every like 50 or something like that. But they just, they just, they just give um, other tools in the OpenAI team environment information about how to behave. Um, so back to the space class. So each of action space and observation space is a instance of the space class. Um, well, it's an instance of something that derives from the space class. Um, there's those different forms uh, you can, and there's discrete box, multi-binary, multi-discrete. Um, it's all ones like tuple and dict where you can effectively create your own out of sub ones. Um, like you might have a list of different spaces, like one continuous, one one discrete, and you can smash them together in a tuple. And then, then your action space can be a combination of continuous and discrete. So for example, um, I don't know what gear to be in and how hard to press the accelerator. If you can then instantaneously change or something, that's a, that's not a good example, but something like that, like, um, I don't know, like what direction to run and should I be shooting this frame or stuff like that. Um, there, you can write your own as well. They're a bit weird to implement because there's not much there and they don't really give you that much. But in most cases, you can usually reconce you can usually conceive of anything you want to do as um, one of the existing action spaces and combine them together to get things out that you want. And what's quite nice is that because these action spaces are built into the environment. If you have an algorithm that requires random sampling, you can just sample directly from that action space. Action space. So I, if you if you want random sampling, you don't have to implement your own random algorithm. You can just be like, okay, environment action space dot sample. Oh, there's a random action. I can put that into my environment with environment dot step, and it will take that random action. And the reason that's useful is that um, when you're doing reinforcement learning. There's always this balance between exploration and exploitation. Um, do I take moves that I know that's good, or do I try something new to find out if I can then do, if I if that's better than my current thing? Uh, and in a lot of settings, your um, your exploration takes the form of just a random move. So that's true for deep queue learning, which is one of the algorithms we're going to be looking at later. Uh, not in too much detail though. Um, yeah, it's also quite nice because if you generate data, if you generate an action, you can also check to see if it's valid. Like you can just say, "Oh, action space does it contain this action I've come up with here?" Um, and th this is implemented. This is implemented on all of the built-in OpenAI gym classes uh, environments, and but. It isn't actually checked at runtime. So if you use the step method in an environment and you feed it something wrong that isn't in the action space, it won't yell at you and say, hey, this isn't in the action space. It will yell at you as like a, I don't know, index error or, oh, it's not an umpire array or, you know, you know, not sort of like, there's no, there's no checks in place, but you can do them yourself and say, oh, is this the right thing or not? Oh, good. But I can take that check out because I know I always produce an umpire array offense three or something um yeah so the action space stuff is also really really important because they can basically be separated into uh two main forms which are continuous and discrete so discrete action space is has a fixed number of possible values and continuous ones have an infinite number of possible values so an example of discrete action state would be if i'm playing a game of solitaire my action i have a lip fixed number of actions at any 
stage of the game which is how to move each card like to move from row one to row two row one to row three row two to row four and yeah like that in fact my action space in that for example might be a tuple of two um discrete values that range over the thing and that says okay i move from here to here sort of thing uh which is you know it works um the continuous action spaces are things like uh i you know i'm i'm playing golf how hard and what direction do i hit the ball in um or you know i'm or you know like i've got a little triangle how do i move it around like i want to go in this direction i want to like push it like 3.72 in the x direction 4.85 in the y direction and rotate by 2.87 degrees like that's those can take any value they there's this like continuous action space where I can choose how to move. Um, the issue, and the big, 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 big issue with continuous action spaces is that a lot of the learning algorithms don't work on them. So if you remember looking at like one of the previous lectures, we had a um, action value function. It's told you if you have a state and if you have an action, this is my expected reward, the Q function. Um, so that's where deep Q learning comes from. It's pretty much the Q, that's it. Um, now, and you say, okay, well, what do I do is I look at all my possible actions and I choose the best one, the one that gives me the best expected reward. And if my Q function is optimal, that is always the optimal choice. Now, you can't do that if you've got an infinite number of actions, an infinite number of possible actions, because you can't just take the max over an infinite list. You'd run out of well, you'd be, you'd be computing its possible actions to the cows come home. So that's that's the one thing you have to be really careful when you're doing stuff like this, is that you can't use strategies like queue learning in continuous action spaces. Uh, so deep queue learning or derivatives of it. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the one of the key things I'd say to take from this, is that, um, yeah, continuous versus discrete action spaces um, you can do other forms of learning on discrete action spaces, like the active critic methods and stuff like that. They will work, but maybe not always useful. Like Q learning generally performs better in those cases. But the the big one is that you cannot use an actor which uses a Q function to internally in a continuous action space because you don't know what all the actions are you have an infinite number of them anyway moving on um we're going to go through the demo so um this slide will be updated with a link to the demo code <laughs> i haven't actually I'll, uh, I'll i'll include it after i finish writing writing the at the end of the lecture um but what we're going to do is we're going to set up a carpool classic control environment um it's slightly different to the Atari 2600 environment in your um, in your in your lecture in your like coursework because there's a couple of funky things you have to do to get it to work um, and those are just like little annoying they're just little problems with the Google Colab platform as a whole and I'll go into more detail later but they get we're then going to take a Q network and we're going to train that on this uh, cart park class control environment um, just you know run it for a few hundred iterations and see how well it does um it should be, i mean it'll learn pretty quickly because it's a pretty simple environment there's only four input there's only four values to observe and there's two actions and there's two possible actions to spit out and the dynamics are quite simple as well uh well then after that we're going to write our own custom environment um and then uh which will require our own observation action spaces um and then train another deep Q network on the custom environment and to compare it how well it performs because we're going to choose a custom environment which um we can just produce an optimal actor for like we know how it will we know how to work how to run it so we'll just do that and we'll compare it with how an optimal actor performs so i'm just going to pause the video and then i will join you in the collab Hi there. So this is the code I was talking about earlier, a Google Colab 
uh, notebook. It's with the code for OpenAI Jim inside it. So this differs slightly to the code you will find in your reinforcement learning uh, coursework because we're using the uh, cart pole environment to demo it, which the rendering of requires to be able to draw to the screen. So we have a couple of cells up top here, this one here uh, to install the virtual frame buffer and external utilities. Um, these aren't installed in Colab instances by default because they're just, well, they're, they're served in a data center somewhere. They don't need to draw to the screen at all. And then we just make sure some packages are installed that we need uh, just so well, we can, can draw. Um, there's a second cell here that's just effectively starts up that frame buffer I was talking about, meaning that we can, well, we can run stuff. We can run stuff that needs to draw to the screen in order to um, render. And so the rest of this code will be very familiar, familiar to you if you've had a look at the reinforcement library already. Um, so reinforcement learning coursework already. We import Jim, this is the OpenAI Jim, and we import a standard selection of packages that we'd use for deep learning. Um, so random NumPy torch, some more torches and that plot live just to see some graphs. Um, we have some basic hyperparameters here dealing with the learning rate of our algorithm. Uh, gamma, which is the discount factor on the future steps in the Bellman equations and in um, the full like time prediction of what we expect to happen. Sorry, yes, so the buffer limit term that we see here uh, refers to the size of this replay buffer class. Now the replay buffer class might seem a bit strange to people, but what it it's there because deep Q net learn deep Q networks or are a off policy um, reinforcement learning algorithm. And what I mean by that is you don't update the weights in your network as you run through an environment. You save your experience of an environment to this replay buffer that's got a max size to it and everything. It's got a max size, you only set you can only fit so many examples in it. If it's infinite, well, you leave something to the drain, you'll run out of memory. Um, so in this, we store, um, effectively in this, we store a tuple of, uh, a tuple which which, de which tells us what the state was at a particular point in time. We store the current state, the action we chose, the state we ended up in, and whether, whether it would finished or not, whether the situation whether the environment had run until the end and we, we were done that's what that final done mass term is um i'll explain the site a bit later what the point of that is but for the moment you don't really need to know so this basically builds up and builds up and builds up as we run um as we run our environment and we run how the um q network should act in that environment over and over and over again and it builds up this big buffer of experience and um, how to act in it. Now, our Q network we use here and what we traditionally consider to be a Q function. So a Q is the action value function, which you use as Q, it's Q of S and A. Um, we do, what we do with the Q network is slightly different. Instead of um, evaluating a queued network um, over a state in action, we evaluate, sorry, we know exactly how many actions we can take because of the situation we're in. We know how many actions we can take. So what we do is we output them in parallel from our queued network. They are just different values in the output vector. Uh, and each of those is if we take action zero, this is what we expect to get as a return. If we take action one, this is what we expect to get as a return. If we take action two, this is what we expect to get as a return. And you do them all in parallel, and then you just say, okay, well, whichever one of these is max, that's the action I take. It's the same basic theory as of, of the as the uh, max over Q of S and A. Well, but in this case, we don't iterate over every A. We just produce them all in parallel, and then we choose which one we want. So. Uh, we have this is so we have like our input size and we have our output size. The output size is equal to the number of actions, and our input size is equal to the size of the 
observation space. Um, forward is just a standard you know, three layer um, fully connected neural network and our sample action is just a a sample action is the is the function where we choose what our our best result is our best action um, that's our argmax here or instead we return a random value between 0 and 1 with probability epsilon and the reason we do that is because we need a we need to make random choices sometimes in order to be able to explore the environment um, this is the exploration exploitation trade-off which is key to most of the problems in reinforcement learning so our third definition here train uh, consists of the core algorithm that deep q learning uses to reinforce uh, the core algorithm that deep q learning uses to um, update and generate a q network which gives out better predictions of how future states will work out so what we have here is we have our um we have our memory here we sample from our memory assuming that we have you know memory which memory which is our replay buffer which has data in it um, we calculate the we calculate we calculate what the different action the different values for each of our actions are you see here we just calculate the forward directly rather than sampling an action um I have to remember that what we do from there is we basically take okay well we know what action we took we took action zero we took action one so we only look at that particular action from our q network uh, and that gives us our qsa this is the uh this is the this is the side of the equation that we're trying to improve um how well it is at guess how well our q function is at guessing what the reward it what the long-term rewards are uh the other side of our equation is reward from reward from the current state action pair um to give by r here or rsa here and then we use the bellman equations uh in order to in order to get an idea of what an estimate of what our future rewards will be on top of that and that's this gamma function which is the discount factor times q target times done mask now this if you had a if you had a perfect q model this would be your q of s and a this would be your best this would be like okay well now i know what my best possible action is so the next day it's the result from that we don't q isn't q isn't a good solution um which in this situation uh means that both of these the q of s and a and our q function our q target function are both wrong but obviously that doesn't quite work well so um you need to so basically you need to optimize both of these the trouble is if you try and optimize both sides of the equation at once by saying okay well our loss is the difference between the two of them which is what we do here um things go horribly wrong and it's very unstable training so what you end up doing instead is you have a q target which is a second neural network identical to the first but the weights lag behind you only update the weights by copying over your original q network every like five ten steps of your of training training runs so what we do is we do this uh repeatedly where we try and optimize the the sort of like the running q function running q network uh until and we do this again and again and then every so often because this this is always out of date and, and worse than this we every so often we update this and we imp and we improve that and then we can get better and better uh q functions over time until maybe we won't re reach the optimal policy but eventually we reach a policy that's well good enough or at least makes the right choices um anyway so standard from here on out we uh calculate that target value there and then our loss is just l1 loss um put smoothed out a bit and then we just take some optimize and loss steps as you would in a standard deep learning algorithm we loop through it 10 times because um we do this training once per evaluation of the 
uh, of the environment. So we run the environment through once, then we train 10 times. You have to remember this is an off policy algorithm, which means that these this sampling isn't from just the last run, it's from every previous run. Every previous run that's still in the memory is still in that replay buffer, uh, which means you can be very sample efficient. You don't actually have to see, you don't have to see the environment over and over and over and over again, because you can continue to learn from past situations, which you, uh, well, which you don't get with on policy learning algorithms. So our next couple of cells are the core of our train, uh, core of our training um, outer loop. Um, our, tra our training function here updates our queue, our queue network, but we also need to actually, you know, sample from the environment and figure out what that what that actually looks like. So initially, we need to set up this environment. Uh, this environment is called Carpole. I have mentioned it a few times. Um, and it's quite a simple looking one. So I'm just going to rip some basic code here. Um, basic code here to get an idea of what this actually looks like. Um, yeah. So this is the output from our environment. This is the observation we'd have. It's literally just an array of four numbers, um, which position and velocity information uh, for the cart and pole that we're talking about. Now, if I just if I use the uh, render method, uh, sorry, I would be doing this with human, but it doesn't quite work on Colab. If I if I do this, we can see what we can actually have a look at what this this does look like. This environment looks like so nicely. This pa this just passes straight into Imshow and we can see it. Uh, so this is our basic environment. It is a little cart, this little black uh, rectangle and this pole, which is this like wooden stick thing balancing on top. Um, this is attached at one end, it's attached at the bottom. If you've ever done that high school, this, that school thing where you have a pen balancing on your finger and you try and keep it up in the air, it's a 2D version of that. And this, and it's a fundamentally unstable, situ unstable equilibrium. You have to manually correct and and correct constantly in order to keep this from falling over this is the environment that uh, we're training we get in this environment we get a we get a new we get a point we get a reward of one for every time step it doesn't well fall over in and if the angle goes above 15 degrees then it fails and we um, that's it the 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 um, environment is done and we have to reset and start again so i'm just going to uh, run up so what we've got here is our big outer loop so going going back to the um lecture slides from earlier we still have the original uh sample action we still have the original thing of resetting the environment sampling an action from q we're just converting it sampling error action given the state we're just converting the torch here um, the added epsilon here is our chance of doing something random and then we take a step in our environment here and take out the observation which is s prime in this case uh are done in info uh, done mask is just done done mask is there as part of the uh training information if you uh get to the end of a run then the then the q the q network at the end will try and predict a reward of plus or minus one or we'll try and predict the reward but there is no future reward because you're at the end of the run so we mask it we mask it out um because if if there's well you know, if, if, if the environment is done, then there's no future reward past the point. So at that final step, the uh, reward is just, well, our reward term. The final. Okay. So what we do here is as we're generating these samples, our samples of um, stay action reward um, and stay afterwards, we always put these into memory and, they, and eventually eventually if memory gets big enough size 2000 here we then start running through that training loop you want your uh, you want your memory to have a nice distribution of possible um 
state action, new state reward uh, tuples, just because it means that when you start learning on it, you have a distribution that is more uh, representative of how the game actually plays. Because if you don't, if that's quite small, your your uh, your network can overfit to the small samples that I can see. So if this is two thousand because, well, you know, it just it's 2000 because it means that you can as i said get a wider distribution okay so same thing here well true if done break and these lines here here and here are the same as in the original loop we keep track of the total score because that's what we want to optimize in the end and we can see while this is training uh, if i just train start running training now that we want the scores to get better and better. So down here I have a couple more little things which will, uh, as you can see from your our coursework, print out the uh, performance in marking. And down here, this is just a nice run so you can see how well your your stuff's doing. Uh, towards the end, this gets better and better. Um, if we have a look at the videos it produces, uh, refresh. Do do fingers crossed it's going to work. No, that's only 14 kilobytes, it doesn't seem right. Oh wait, yep, yeah, there we go. Let's play that again. Yeah, so this is slowly learning how to balance the cart and the pole. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to rerun this for longer, uh, a thousand steps, and we should see it do better. Okay, so training is now running. Um, as this goes on, we'll be able to see the score improve over time. Uh, 200 there, yep, this this environment also stops after 200 time steps. Um, you can balance you can balance it forever, so it doesn't make sense to keep it going. Um, we'll see that eventually this will reach a point where it almost, consi it almost consistently uh, does very well. While we're waiting, we can have a look at some of the videos already have already been rendered. Um, that's actually to re re do do. If they don't, they're not appearing. Just remember to hit the refresh button. Uh, do do do. So this was the initial case, the uh, worst possible case. Um, it doesn't really know what it's doing, and we'll see it almost crash immediately. Uh, oh no, sorry, that was the first time. So you did an environment dot render didn't I, and then reset it later. Let's have a look at 25 instead. Yeah, so it immediately shoots left and the, this falls over. Once it reaches 15 degrees, it that, that's it, it's finished. The run has finished. So we are getting to the point where it, almost cons it very consistently scores highly. So if we have a look at one of these late videos, um, we go uh, let's do 975 how have you done yeah there we go so it's getting better at moving left and right and you know keeping it going eventually this this will get to the point where it will see that uh See that it should that it's actually like pushing. It's not pushing hard enough, and will like write it. But it just needs more samples until it does that. But as you can see the uh, tra the results from here mean score of like one eight eight for this run compared to a mean score of well less than ten means that this it's performing a lot better basically. As another example of a run, this one does quite well. So that is the basic um, loop of how to run a little OpenAI gym demo using a built-in environment. So next I'm going to talk about building a custom environment. And what I'm going to be doing using as an example custom environment is based upon the old British game, so play, play your cards right. So if you're not familiar, play your cards right involves um, dealing uh, several cards from a fixed deck, fixed deck, 
uh, that's been shuffled face down you flip the first one over and then you have to guess higher or lower for the second one you flip it over if it's good if it's right if you're right you carry on playing if you don't well that's the end of the game so you flip the second one over higher or lower again flip seven over higher or lower again flip the fourth another higher or lower again and so on and so forth now this game is quite an interesting one because um the states later in the game are basically unobservable until you get good enough at the game to do well at it at the start which means it's quite an interesting problem to train because you can't just randomly sample you have to continuously update your memory buffer so that those later states about how to play later on in the game are updated now our custom environment here um, is involves constructing the number of I've, what I've done is I've broken this up into several separate sections because uh, the game plays quite differently based upon how many cards you can the range of the cards you can draw and the number of cards you play out um, so what I've done is I've set, set this as two external variables that you can just change and they'll, they'll propagate through and the whole thing will work fine so what we need to do is firstly we need to construct our action spaces um, so the space in which we act is quite simple it's discrete we can either guess higher we can guess lower but the observation space is the space that what we see in front of us now that's that's a bit different give me a second to take a drink so the question is how do you represent that how do you represent um a discrete set of cards um which it then learns from now there's a few different ways here and the way i've chosen um is make well, when it works basically and what i've used is i'm using the gym uh multi-binary space so this is a n eventual binary space which means that i have a drawn count by highest card plus one array of ones and zeros and what i'm going to do is i'm going to use one hot encoding so i'll use the i'm going to use the zero value or the first or the zeros index to represent a hidden card and the other ones one through up to highest card to represent the um the cards one through n so in this case um this space isn't quite right though because um this is the space the observations come from the observations we see are that but obviously doing one hot encoding so only ever one will be only ever one of these uh, values in each row will be a one the rest are zeros but that's fine i mean the thing is your ob observation space is always going to be bigger than the uh total number of total number of actual possible games of states you have i mean for example if we take if we have a look at the um original i mean the actual uh atari games the get the observation state is a stack of four frames four frames of the game um for the non-ram versions now obviously random noise and stuff like that is never going to appear as those frames there's only a set amount of frames. there's only there's a lot of frames that will just won't appear effectively and aren't part of the actual space of the game but they're part of the space that the observation space can rep can represent um sorry two seconds okay yep yeah, there we go so steam notifications so anyway in this i'm going to create a uh, play your cards right environment i've called it brucey because it used to be presented by uh bruce forsyth but um you know it doesn't really matter what you name it so here i inherit from the gym.environment class and i define several class attributes which are constants so the ones you have to do are the action space and the observation space uh, which i defined up here um, these are instances of the of these separate uh, space subclasses um, i also define the broad wing range so what i'm doing is every time you get guess a card right you get a one every time you get it wrong it's a zero and it's also the end of the game um, max episode, episode steps is just how many how many rounds can you play in an episode um, and the max is going to be one less than the cards that are placed out in front of you because there's five cards in front of you you get four guesses because you already know what the first one is um, deck here is just a range one to n of 
end cards and the other two parts here are just for rendering purposes it makes it slightly more obvious what's going on so our init method is very simple there's nothing to init um because all of this stuff that we want we want to like deal the cards out and have them hidden all that stuff is done every time we reset so there we go it's just a basic init function with a super call so that gym to environment whatever that does as it initializes also gets called um so this is a bit of a funky thing um i keep internal track of a steps counter i also have um i create a uh, list of what the cards are in front of me so effectively deal uh drawn count down in front all face down uh that's what the hidden cards is uh this keeps track of what every card should be but some you can only see what some of them are um so self dot guesses is just a more bookkeeping so that when i'm when i'm in, when i'm like see looking at my what my actor's done i can see oh did it make a right did it make a lower guess or a higher guess is that the right choice there i can just keep this i can just have a look at that and that gets reset every time i reset the game um so obs is basically what i'm calling the observation and i initialize it to just being a load of zeros so everything's initialized as the hidden state um sorry not the hidden state everything's initialized as the hidden cards it's zero so i see my observation here is draw count hidden cards that's the basic state now i've set steps to one here so from naught to self dot steps so the first card is the same as self dot hidden cards so that first card effectively gets flipped over and then here I just do some one heart encoding. Uh, yeah, it's not the easiest to it's not the easiest to understand, but if you trust me, that just that just gives you the one heart encoding of a array of integers. Now, so after writing the uh, reset function, I assume that there's an actor somewhere that will spit will read that and spit back out an action and I can read that. Now I've assumed as before that my action is just a one or a zero, whether it's guessing higher or it's guessing lower. Uh, if that's the case, um, what I do now is I say, I just keep track of what the previous action is just for bookkeeping purposes. Um, uh, this is only ever written into like the, the actor never sees any of its previous actions. It just, it's just kept here. Info is I'm keeping an empty dictionary of metadata. There's not really much you can say about this at the moment. Um, and I determine if the card is higher, if the, well, if, if the next card is higher than the previous one, it's as simple as that. I look at hidden steps at my current game state, and then I look at the next game state and well, yeah. So then I increment steps. I then show them the next card. As well so steps is higher once so this new observation is longer it's the same one hot encoding down here uh, and then we decide what to do so if the card if the card is higher and our action was yeah guess higher well there's reward one and if you're not finished done equals it you're not done either else done equals true if, if your guess was wrong you reward zero and you're and you're also finished so then we just return that now in this in this example, there's no point me me rendering a big like 2D image of the card faces and stuff like that. Like that's just it's a bit it's a bit over the top, really, isn't it? Like I mean, I'm gonna have to like find some textures and like draw them to a screen somewhere. So what I've done instead is our render method just prints out to the uh, screen what the uh, what the layout the cards is so i'm just going to run this to initialize it and then i'm going to create an environment called brucey i'm going to reset it and i'm going to render it oh dear me okay yeah i know what the issue is um this only goes up to cards nine. I said the highest card is ten, so this does fix this. Let's make it seven instead. Okay, so let's try that again. Yep. So here's a little drawing I'm doing. Uh, I am 
so this this top row here is the observation I get. That's what obs there is. I see the cunt. I see three, and the rest are hidden. Uh, the guesses I've made, I've made no guesses yet, and as you can tell by the guesses, array being empty, and the final line is the actual sequence I should get. So if, if I run that again, well, you know, let's, re let's reset. Um, let's put into our code. And we're going to guess that it's probably lower than a six. But yeah. It returns observation. Um, next one is actually a two. So I'm going to guess higher. Um, and I'm just going to render it now to see like what the game state is. And there we go. That's that's the game says. So I guess lower. I guess higher. Oh, okay, it was a three, but yeah, same deal. Um, oh yeah, that was wrong. I started at naught. Um, but yeah, so so I guess higher. But I actually got a two. Uh, as as you can see, our reward here when I guessed wrong was a zero, and the game ended. I was done. So at this point, I should reset and then play it again. But I'm not going to. I'm just going to run the. I'm just going to run through and make sure we get results. So once again, we're now going to train a Q network, um, which takes in a linear, li this becomes linearized and it takes that in and then it returns two. So same thing again. Now that we've got a custom class, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, I've stripped this down a bit. There's no uh, rendering because that a wrapper isn't around the environment. Uh, that wrapper isn't around the environment. This um, monitor wrapper here so we this this will just run like we won't get any output from it but what it will do is it will pop out quite quickly so you saw the first hundred thousand episodes or so just came through very quickly that is because uh the, there's no actual updates to the q network it's just generating samples um s and c scores of ones and zeros and threes and ones and zeros all, all quite terrible um you know, really, we want scores of sevens and eights because that's the length of it, right? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we draw sevens, so we want sixes. We want to get sixes. Um, yeah. Once this is finished running, I will be back. Okay, so we have finished training. Um, Ten thousand steps. That took quite a long time. Now, if what you will notice, um, hopefully, if the resolution isn't too bad. Uh, I'll zoom out actually, is that our mean scores are still terrible. They, on average, are scoring about 2.5, um, which, you know, is awful. Like, if we, if this was a, if this was not, if this was working perfectly, we would expect um, it to be getting sixes all the time. It should be getting, guessing them all right. The, the issue is, is our environment is stochastic. There is no guarantee of a win even if you play perfectly for example if the first card is a two and i if the first card is a two i say well obviously it should be higher um that's that's my best choice but the next card is a one well I've, I've got it wrong i've got it wrong and that's the end of the game like it's possible to lose this game even with optimal play um and that's an important part about stochastic um and that's an important part to remember if you have an environment which is stochastic or there's a degree of randomness in it. Unlike the cart pole above, I don't know what the environment's going to do here. All I can do is I can use my Q function to S as a expectation, and that's why it's an expectation of how the environment's going to behave and what my reward will be in the long long run. So what I have actually done is I've actually coded up a couple of extra policies for this. So instead of running, instead of our policy of our actor coming from this Q network, I have um, coded up optimal policies and a random policy as well. Um, the optimal policy looks at the cards that are already out and and says, okay, well, say for example, it's a three, four, say the example, the max card is a six and I see a three, four, five, and I'm looking at this card. Well, I'm going to say it's definitely, I'm going to say it's definitely lower because it'd be a one or a two, or it could be a six. So my chances are it's a one or a two. Um, another example would be, say I have, um, yeah, so 
you know, I'll give you an example. Basically, it takes into account what cards it's, it can see on the table and uses those to work out what the most likely outcome is. If there's more cards lower left, it goes for those. If there's more cards higher left, it goes for those. Even if you're in a situation where, say, the only say you've got a four out and the only cards left are a one, a five, and a six. So you know there's more cards lower than four, but they're already out on the table. So we'll guess that it's higher because it's five and six left. That's what Optor policy does. And I've also created a random policy which just chooses randomly. So you can have a look at how well these these do. Um, and I am just going to optimize and run them here. And I will plot all three of these things on a graph at the end. Uh, what I'll also do is I will make, here we go. So our, our random policy is here in green. As you can see, it's quite bad. Uh, originally our, um, our, our Q learn policy was the worst of all. Um, but after it starts learning, the performance gradually increases over time until it hits about the same sort of level as our optimal policy. Now, it doesn't quite reach it. And this is primarily because in reason you have this sort of like quick, quick increase uh, up to around two of getting cards, cards right early on and then taking a long time to slowly increase is due to that, um, that sort of like long term, hey, I don't know how to act in later stages because... I haven't got enough samples of actually being in them to know what's a good and what's a bad action. And that's that's basically it. And this, this is what um, this is basically another thing you need to remember when you're doing things like um, deep Q networks and stuff like that is that the you have to have is that a lot of the like naive algorithms don't have um, any form of important sampling. So it might perfectly know how to play the first cards in this or the optimal method to play the first card but when it comes to the second or third card it hasn't seen any uh, examples of that because its replay buffer is just full of oh here's what i do for one card so yeah and those are the things i wanted to show you and i hope that you've learned from this demo so what i'm going to do is i'm going to end this here and then give a quick bit of information on ncc and how to connect Okay, so the final section of this lecture will be looking at NCC. Uh, NCC is the Computer Science Department's cluster of uh, GPUs. Um, if any of you have previously worked with Hamilton, the university's high performance computing system, um, it uses the same back end to schedule jobs uh, and share GPUs between multiple users. Uh, this comes from the like so this comes to the idea of well you know if, it, if, it, if you have a gpu sat in someone's desktop somewhere two-thirds of the time they're not using it i mean and it, it's basically wasted so instead the department has a large bank of um gpus in split across about nine servers uh as well as some cpu um blades which can be used for other like pre-processing tasks which can be used um, by undergrads and by researchers in order to run code that requires longer run times than you would get with Google Colab. Um, so the uh, so the back back end we use is Slurm, and Slurm's a pretty is a well known and common high performance computing back end to schedule jobs. And what are we doing today is going through how that how that works. Um, if you are a liver out or you live, um, yeah, if you're a liver out or you're not in college uh, and getting into the and getting access to the university Wi-Fi is difficult due to like the whole situation that's going on now, um, you will need to use the, Dur the Durham University VPN in order to gain access to it. It sat inside the university network and over the summer um, the access rights to Myra were changed which makes it a bit more difficult to get on. Um, they may change again, so maybe access to tomorrow works, but I think you, but either way, uh, you will have to get, use two-factor authentication to use either the VPN or to access Myra in the future. So if you can get to Myra from outside university and then use that to access stuff, brilliant. If you can't, then use the university VPN. So uh, the, 
the idea the idea so with ncc you just connect to it via ssh um it's just your U ssh with your durham university username so you know four digit four letter to number number code at ncc1.clients.dur.ac.uk you will use your university password to log in and that will log you into the outward facing job scheduling node um, so on this one you submit jobs uh, in a slurm script and you uh, they are then scheduled to run hopefully immediately because most of the time there's gpus free uh, the but not all, but you know sometimes it's overloaded unless there's deadlines for big for big um, um, conferences and stuff like that uh, the data you upload here is separate to your J drive it's completely separate um, and the main and the main reason for that is you will you don't have enough space in your J drive and data sets will be big if you're taking timestamps of if you're taking like timestamps of how well your models are over time so you're looking at the weights and stuff and saving them to a file they'll be big you just you'll produce far more data than you have access to on your j drive and it will quickly fill up um, there is a website a little web page that also runs in ncc1 um, which will give you information about how to write slurm scripts um, if you would rather go through this in text rather than how i'll be explaining it to you um, there's also a few basic commands that are useful, um, sq which will give you a list of the jobs in all, that are about to run, sbatch where you can submit a job and stop, I didn't choose the name, this, this, is a, this was used by, a, this was written by a student called Greg, um, Greg Rahr, um, and I think he's maybe left now, but it's a very useful way to see what your CPU and GPU utilization is of the jobs you're running, uh, which can help you optimize your code and make sure that um, you're not just you know you haven't got a, you've got a massive like titan xp and it's running at 10 percent um usage because your code spends all its time waiting for new data it, it's basically prevent a situation like that or at least let you let you be able to see when that's going to happen so the quick demo i'm going to go through is login ncc i'll give an example of python virtual environments because on NCC, you will definitely need to use Python virtual environments because the system Python, the libraries we use, things like PyTorch, will aren't kept up to date. Um, and also the basics of writing a Slurm script and how to submit a job and do some progress review. So I'm just going to stop here and open up a couple of terminals and show you what's going on. Hello. So what I have on my screen is the basic project configuration you need to used to connect with SSH. Um, B-U-T-T-Y is a little Windows application. If you're on Linux, I'll also show you how to, but um, for the moment, you just want your username for your Durham University username uh, at ncc1.advanced.ac.uk and connect to port 22. Uh, so just open that. I'll ask for your university password. And there you go, that, that's it, you're logged in. Right, you can view your files on there, and you're done. I'm not going to use Putty because the font rendering is terrible. Um, if you're on Linux, this is the little Linux thing. Um, it's just SSH. Uh, yep, yeah, and you'll log in. Um, I have... Uh, key login set up so it didn't ask me for a password but it would usually ask you for a password here uh, once again you can view your stuff so um, I'm going to use uh, tmux to show you multiple features at the same time um, you don't need to do this this just makes it easier for me to show you as we're going on but this effect just works as a standard command line um, so uh, I can now show you two things at once. So um, what I do have is a example M bit of MNIST code, um, which is just a standard classification of MNIST digits. Um, if I run uh, just main.py, we'll see that, oh, let's zoom out so that it doesn't got what line up. We'll see that this is just very simple um, code that 
has a basic net of two convolutional layers, two fully connected layers, max pooling, um, little train function, little test function. These are just test arguments. Um, and then a call little loop here where it's using train load data loaders as well. So this is a this is a very basic deep learning script for um, classifying digits in the MNIST data set. Uh, so when you want to um, when you want to run code on NCC, you can't run it direct directly. Like I can't just run um python 3 main.py like if i do that i will cause lots of problems uh, so what you want to do is you want to use something called a slurm script and the slurm script i've written here is called run.sh it is we call them slurm scripts but they're basically bash scripts with some little fixed uh commands this batch here which let you know how many how many machines to use how many different servers to use so we're using one server one machine one node is what the n stands for and we're using one core on it as well as saying okay we want this job to take giga ram max um and then through here we say yes we're going to use a gpu these this is the partition uh i'm res gpu small which means that it's researcher gpu um and small is just i'm going to use one of the smaller gpus uh, yours will be ug gpu small, but do check the NCC documentation that I linked in the presentation. Um, and quality of service is just how long the job's going to run for, and short is two days. Um, you have long, low priority, and long, high priority as well. Uh, there's a limit to how many jobs you can run of different sorts, uh, The and I would not recommend trying for low priority. Uh, long jobs they can run for two weeks non-stop but they can also be preempted as in they'll stop running and then start again later on which if you haven't got your script set up to do that can be very bad so in this code here um uh, what I, because ncc ship ncc has multiple versions of cuda on it to deal with different libraries uh, you have to use um the module command to load particular versions of CUDA. Uh, here I'm going to use code, CUDA 9 because I originally gave this, I originally used this code in uh, 2018 in the presentation, but use um, the most recent version of CUDA you can because usually you get better support and it runs more efficiently. You can um, see what modules are available by just typing mod your uh, avail. At the moment, I'll give you a list, and as you can see, uh, we have CUDA up to 10.1 with QDNN, which is the specialist um, deep learning CUDA extensions 7.6. So, when you choose what version of uh, PyTorch to install um, and stuff like that, make sure you choose the right one basically. Anyway, so what you will also need to do is to use virtual environments because NCC has a wide range of different users who use different packages and if they start colliding things will go wrong so you need to make you basically need to set up your own python environment and fortunately that's actually very simple and it's not quite complicated at all so i just type virtual environment and i'll list the help options to see what we actually can put on the end this is this is a bit long but the only thing you really need to notice is that you can say you need to specify what type of python you want to use um, NCC runs on uh, Ubuntu 18.04, I think. So the most recent version of Python is 3.7, and I suggest using that one. So if I want to make a new virtual environment, I would type, well, I'll clear it first, make it obvious. I would type in virtual environment. No, wait, what, do I, what did I type last time? Virtual environment, yep. Um, Python equals 3.7. And then I give it a name, and I'm going to call this uh, RL test. Uh, you say you need to give it the name of the executable you want to base it around. There we go. So 
this is creating my own little pipe installation and what i need to do then is and i need to activate it so right now this isn't activated so if i can do it's it's easy it's like not these are where the pipe the python executables it's found are none of these are the one in this folder if i do ls we'll see that there is a rl test folder um I call that, and that's where my python vector one is so what i need to type in is source rl underscore test bin activate which now means that this little ter this terminal this window here is running in that python virtual environment if i want my scripts to run in that python virtual environment what i need to do is i need to use a virtual environment in my slurm script and i need to change it to the same source command i use there so this is just rl underscore test bin activate so i'm going to save that and quit it um, uh, make sure when you do this or when you upload it that these scripts are executable as well so otherwise they'll be scheduled they'll start running and they'll be like oh I, I can't run this bash script because it's not executable so you just do that ch mod plus x run plus h uh, and that that's done there now the problem is this rl test has basically no packages installed uh, so what you want to do in this situation is you want to install the right version of the packages. Uh, uh, so in this one, uh, I'm using CUDA 9. So I need to install a version of PyTorch that works with CUDA 9. Um, I'm going to go to the PyTorch website and pick out the right version. Just give me a second. Okay, so a quick look shows that it's not very keen on supporting CUDA 9. So what we're going to do is instead we're going to run the different version of CUDA. Um, in this case, we're going to choose CUDA 10.1 and then QDNN 7.6. So what I'm going to do is just change this to 10.1 dash 7.6. Um, what I'm going to do is also double check that that works by copy and paste and get into a terminal and if it yells at me it's fine no it doesn't yell at me that version of CUDA work um, okay so what you then want to do is you then want to select the version of CUDA you have on the PyTorch website which is one point, we're going to use 10.1 uh, we're using pip to install um, and we're on Linux doesn't actually do anything to change it let's say we just copy and paste this um, and that should install the version of torch we want now while we're waiting for that to install um, I'm just going to double I'm going to save that um, and I'm going to double check what uh, other programs we're using. So main.py. Um, so yeah, so we use argpass, which is built in. Uh, Future is built in. Uh, Torch Fusion we're also installing. So that is all good. The uh, the but the torch installation is will take quite a long time so be aware because the base package is 700 megabytes in size um, once this runs we'll then see about setting this virtual environment to run so we're just going to wait for a while for this to install okay so we have installed our virtual environment um, it's in RL tests we've installed um, pipe PyTorch and TorchVision, which are the two major packages we need, using the commands on the website. That's using the most recent version. Um, now it's just time to look at this job being put in the queue. Um, so what we type in is we type in sbatch run.sh, which is the Slurm script we wrote earlier. 
then that's now in the queue. Um, if I type in SQ, we can see it should be there. There I am. I am this job right here, and it's been running for 57 seconds. Um, so what you can do now is uh, you can look at the output from it and see what it's printed out. This, um, yeah, so it's passed through that very quickly. Um, I mean, come on, it's MNIST. It's a very small network and it's running on GPU3, which is, it was running on GPU3. What is GPU3? Oh, okay. That command's not gonna, there we go. GPU3 is a Titan XP, so. Yeah, I'm not too worried about that. Um, jump over. Yeah, so where are we again? Yeah, there we go. It's been running for one minute, 53 now. Um, and it's running through again and again and again in different training epochs. Um, I'm not actually saving anything from this. The different, the GP, so this is running on a different server to this one, but they have the same file system. So you can just write things to the same home folder and they'll appear back in your compute and they'll appear back on your home folder on the NCC login node, the one you're typing commands into. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's just the same files. It's the, it's the same network shared file system. So don't worry about that at all. Um, if you want to look at how good your code is, use stop. And this will list the processes you have running. So I have this 72144. That's a job I'm running. These are the processes running into that job. Um, so there are four processes um, because I was using the data loader to produce the second one. And you have your GPU utilization here. Now, if I'm looking at this code, I've got an average GPU utilization of 5%. Um, that's because I'm throwing tiny things through. Uh, a, I'm throwing tiny things at Titan XP. My CPU can't read data fast enough to keep up with it. That's fundamentally the problem. And when you're writing codes, when you're writing stuff for NCC, the biggest performance gain you can do, get early on is just writing it in a way that your GPU has never started. I could run through this 10 times faster if I could load stuff fast enough, but I, I can't at the moment. Anyway, that job appears to have finished. So let's see what we did. Um, Slurm.721.4.out. Yeah, there we go. We got 9970 accuracy after running um, 600,000 iterations of uh, the MNIST uh, test. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's how you run a job on NCC. And that is also the end of the lecture. I will upload the slides with updated information and a link to the uh, Google Colab in embedded in them. And I hope you all get on okay with NCC and with Google Colabs. Thank you.